Hello everybody. Uh, it is Thursday the 26th of March 2020 and we are currently in lockdown. Uh, in this brave new COVID-19 world where uh, we're all getting to grips with remote hearings and uh, video technology, uh, we wanted to put together for you a Park Lane Plowden bite-sized webinar. So welcome. Um, today we'll be tackling the various considerations that local authorities and parents will be facing following the impact of the government guidance upon contact arrangements. Uh, as many of you will know, the guidance has resulted in uh, what we understand to be national closure of contact centres and many social workers are now working remotely. So where does this leave the local authority in discharging their duty to children in their care and for parents who wish to see their children during this time? Um, before we start to outline these issues, just as a brief disclaimer, uh, this video is not formal legal advice, uh, but it's intended to be an outline discussion of the considerations that will be at the forefront of the local authorities and many parents' minds at this difficult time. Uh, of course, as the situation on the ground develops, the government may well release more guidance to clarify matters. Uh, speaking today, we have Chloe, who is a second six pupil in Chambers, and then Emily, Nathaniel, and myself, Maxine, who are all tenants in the family team here at Park Lane Plowden. Between us, we have considerable experience in public law proceedings, and whilst advice will generally vary for each individual case, uh, we've tried to outline the key duties and considerations in relation to contact with children in care at this time. So I think we're moving on to my part, aren't we? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so the law, um, well, as everybody who's watching this video will probably know, um, contact arrangements when a child is in local authority care. So I'm talking about both ICOs and final care orders here, but for the purpose of this talk, really focusing on interim care orders. So when a child's in local authority care, usually a parent's contact will be supervised in the contact centre. Um, sometimes it's community-based but supervised. Um, sometimes a parent will have two, two times per week contact, sometimes three, sometimes even four. Um, it doesn't really matter how often a parent's spending time with their children during this time or are meant to be spending time with the children during this time. Um, the fact is, um, there's a huge problem in the current climate with enabling parents to spend their two, three, four times per week contact with their children. Um, and wh where do we start really from here? Well, uh, as again, most people who are watching this video will know, um, when a court determines any question with respect to the upbringing of a child, that child's welfare is to be the court's paramount consideration. Uh, and usually, the child's welfare interests dictate that they should be spending time with their parents. Local authorities do, of course, have a duty to promote contact when a child's in the care of that local authority. Section 34.1 of the Children Act um, sets out very clearly that where a child is in the care of the local authority, the local authority shall allow the contact child reasonable contact with his parents. Any guardian, special guardian, anyone with parental responsibility, anyone that's named in a child arrangements order um, where this was enforced immediately prior to the care order being made uh, and that that person is the person who it says that the child is to live with. So the, the local authority has a duty to promote contact with those individuals. That, of course, is subject to the provision in Section 22.3a of the Children Act. Um, and that explains the duty that is placed on the local authority to safeguard and promote a child's welfare uh, is to be considered when we're, we're looking at the question of Section 34.4, um, local authority's duty to promote contact. Uh, this week, there have been a lot of meetings, um, both in Leeds and across the country. There have been many hearings across the North East and across the country. Uh, and contact has nearly always been one of the issues on the agenda. Uh, and that's because contact centres are closed. That's because social workers can't be supervising contact in the community with a child because of the current uh, regulations, stipulations of the government. Um, but the information as to the court's approach this week ha has, in our experience, universally been very similar, if not identical. Um, and that is very much that local authorities need to be thinking outside the box at the current time. Child's welfare, um, 
demands actually uh, that they spend time with their parents uh, unless it would be unsafe to do so. Welfare trumps all. Uh, and as I've said earlier, child's welfare interests usually mean they should spend time with a parent. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, however, we, we need to look at the circumstances where local authorities do have permission to refuse contact. Um, those are circumstances, um, for example, where there's a very violent uh, individual who it simply wouldn't be appropriate for the child to be spending time with uh, because of the potential risk of that child. Um, the local authority, of course, under Section 34.6, um, are able to refuse contact for up to seven days if they're satisfied that it's necessary to do so in order to safeguard or promote that child's welfare and the refusal is decided upon as a matter of urgency. Um, to me, um, it seems as though local authorities at the moment may feel as though they can get round the current contact issue for the short period of next few days by saying, well, we can refuse contact for the next seven days. I'm not sure that's right because um, one, it's not really, in, in my view, a, a matter of urgency. And two, it's, it's certainly not necessary to stop contact in order to safeguard or promote a child's welfare when there's potentially other options that can be considered um, by the local authority um, to enable contact to take place. Courts are going to be very annoyed if there are a series of Section 34.4 applications. So that's the application for the court to make an order authorising the local authority to refuse to allow contact between the child and the parent. The court at this time is going to be extremely annoyed if numerous applications are made under that section when local authorities haven't looked outside the box. Of course, um, we need to consider everything um, in line with what it says in, in Section 34 um, and also Schedule 2, Paragraph 15 of the Children Act, uh, which is that local authority shall unless um, um, shall, uh, where a child is being looked after by a local authority, shall, in accordance with the welfare, endeavour to provide contact with a parent. Uh, and that, again, is, is why we need to be looking outside the box and ensuring that children, at this very difficult time for them, very difficult time for their parents, um, aren't simply cut adrift and unable to even see their parents for what could be a, a number of months. So um, I think we'll move on to now for our suggestions for what potentially uh, could work moving forward. And in fact, has been um, something that has already been put in place in some of the cases that we've all dealt with. Um, so I think I'm passing on now to Emily. Thank you. Uh, it is right then that local authorities are now looking to uh, indirect contact as an alternative way to fulfil their duty to promote contact. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, available options uh, in respect of uh, video calls. Uh, we have had a look at some of the different platforms for video calling, including Skype, Zoom and House Party. Uh, other video conferencing tools are available, all of which allow multiple participants to join the call should there be joint contact sessions with siblings in different placements or parents living separately. Um, also for a supervising contact worker to be present on the call as well. Uh, Skype, Zoom and House Party all allow for users to sign up using an email address rather than a mobile number, which has the potential to be of benefit to foster carers. Uh, with the assistance of the local authority, foster carers may be able to set up uh, designated email accounts with sensitively named email addresses, which can be used to make final arrangements for uh, indirect contact whilst protecting uh, the privacy of foster carers. Additionally, when using Skype and Zoom, it is possible to record conversations which may be of benefit to the local authority, particularly in cases uh, where they are deferring to foster carers to supervise indirect contact in circumstances where it's safe to do so. Uh, recording could mean that evidential difficulties uh, around foster carers providing statements and so on is avoided further down the line should any issues uh, arise during indirect contact sessions. CAFCAS have also provided some guidance for families who are co-parenting during, during the pandemic, uh, which may be a useful tool for local authority practitioners to signpost parents to for guidance in uh, engaging with their children in video contact in a meaningful way. 
the link to the guidance and the CAFCAS website is provided below. Communicating over video can feel a little alien and parents and practitioners alike uh, are going to have to think creatively about how to support families to stay in touch. Examples from the guidance, particularly where you have younger children, uh, CAFCAS suggests that calls can be used to read stories or for families to uh, sing and play together. With older children, you could also give consideration, uh, CAFCAS says, to what they call a watch party, where you gather online to watch a movie or video, commenting and reacting in real time. We found that house party video calls may also be of benefit for older children, as the, applica the application includes uh, built-in activities, games, trivia and so on for parents to utilise. All of these suggested tools are ways which the local authority can begin to think creatively about ensuring contact is promoted where it's reasonably practicable to do so uh, and in accordance with the child's welfare interests. So turning now to practical matters that need to be considered, um, these will depend greatly on the age of the child and the usual nature of contact. So some areas to consider include the parent's ability to have access to the internet and to devices that would have this software on. They may not have enough data, Wi-Fi or funds to top up those um, devices in order to access these things. So consideration should be given to the use of data top ups by the local authority to ensure that they are able to do so and software that's free e and easy to use. Foster carers will also need support with this technology and the local authority should be able to communicate with them directly to ensure that they're able to fulfill the, the need for contact. And lastly, in relation to the age, consideration should be given to the productiveness of contact methods such as Skype when dealing with quite a young child and whether that contact would be appropriate. Now, in relation to supervision, which we've touched on a bit already, we, overall, there needs to be a sensible and practical approach to this. Obviously, direct supervision in the home or a contact centre can't go ahead at the moment, but that means a fresh analysis of the risks involved in each case is needed to decide how best to pre proceed with the supervision. One possibility is to ask foster, foster carers to supervise. Um, while this is an additional burden, it's different to say supervising in a contact centre and they would also have the benefit of say using Skype where that contact can also be recorded to provide an extra layer of protection to them. If the foster carers are unable or unwilling, then another idea to explore is whether a social worker or a supervisor can join remotely through, say, Skype. And um, that would again be recorded. So that would also provide um, a manner of protecting in relation to litigation and having um, a record of the contact that went ahead. Now, we've spent some time looking at video conferencing, um, as this is likely to be the, be the next best option to face to face contact. But there are, of course, other alternatives uh, worthy of mention during this uh, short webinar. Um, regular, normal telephone contact may be of use in particular situations, particularly with children of a certain age. Um, the frequency of that contact and the duration will, of course, need to be in the child's best interest and issues of supervision will remain prevalent. But this is certainly a means of communication that will come to the forefront in this new world. Um, there may also need to be consideration of frequent letters between parent and child or sharing of drawings, uh, subject to the content remaining appropriate, uh, in addition to cards, pictures, small presents, etc. Uh, you may even have a situation where a carer is content to send regular picture updates and, and videos of the child or children to the parents. And there are privacy protecting apps um, out there to achieve this, one of which uh, some of us have worked with before is called Talking Parents. So again, another um, option for exploring. And finally, um, there are many children in, in care, um, children subject to protective plans, and children with social work involvement, um, who it seems will be categorised as vulnerable for the purpose of continued education and attendance at school. 
for those children, there may be scope in particular circumstances for some level of direct contact still taking place. But of course, that would have to remain in line with government guidance as it stands today and as it may well develop. And also uh, would have to continue being safe for uh, children, parents and supervisors in the context of COVID-19, but also in the context of the child's welfare. Just one more matter that we wanted to, to point out or highlight was that it's likely that children's birthdays will remain incredibly important to parents and children, especially during this pandemic when um, it has forced restrictions um, upon regular daily life. Um, therefore, ensuring that some form of contact on or around these special occasions should be prioritised and is likely to reduce any um, significant concerns or, or heightened emotions at those particular times. Um, it's going to be a lot for local authorities to navigate through. It's also going to be a difficult time for parents and children, but it is more than ever um, a time of requiring cooperation and um, attempting to, to work a way through this at unprecedented times for everybody uh, in the children's best interests. Um, that's it from us today, but please look out for the private law bite size webinar, which is also being released today on the issue of contact for children where parents are separated. Um, and also keep an eye out for our upcoming uh, webinar wisdom program, uh, which may be renamed, but will be available very soon. Um, finally, just a reminder that courts are still functioning via Skype for business and barristers and solicitors are still working remotely. Um, if you are a solicitor and there is anything we can assist with, please do not hesitate to contact us at Park Lane Plowden. Uh, we're happy to help and give advice where we can. Uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, stay safe, everybody. <laughs>